Travis Wayne gets home. In August 1992, President Ezra Taft Benson, along with Gordon B. Hinckley and Thomas S. Monson, gave the First Presidency Statement on the King James Version of the Bible. This statement reads as follows. First Presidency has released the following letter regarding the King James Version of the Bible. Since the days of the Prophet Joseph Smith, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints didn't exist in Joseph Smith's time. What is he talking about? Has used the King James Version of the Bible for English-speaking members. The Bible, okay, that failed. As it has been transmitted over the centuries, has suffered the loss of many plain and precious parts. We believe the Bible to be the Word of God as far as it is translated correctly. We also believe the Book of Mormon to be the Word of God. In case you didn't know, the plain and precious parts comes from the great and abominable church taking away from the book written by a Jew in the Book of Mormon. Many versions of the Bible are available today. <coughs> Unfortunately, no original manuscripts of any portion of the Bible are available for comparison to determine the most accurate version. However, the Lord has revealed clearly the doctrines of the Gospel in these latter days. The most reliable way to measure the accuracy of any biblical passage is not by comparing different texts but by comparison with the Book of Mormon and modern-day revelations. I did that and was kicked out of the church for it. It was Adam Fell. Adam Fell is in the Book of Mormon. The Bible says Eve Fell. I used the Book of Mormon, I used this First Presidency Statement, I did the video on YouTube, and my bishop trapped me, cornered me, and says, I want you to take it down. Why are you bothering to come to church if you're going to go against the prophets? <laughs> I'm not going to be extorted, and so I never went back to church. While other Bible versions may be easier to read than the King James Version, in doctrinal matters, no, 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 no. Latter-day Revelation supports the King James Version in preference to the other English translations. Joseph Smith himself said in the King Follett Discourse, which I'll get to in a minute, said that the, the German Version by Martin Luther is the most accurate doctrinally. <laughs> All of the presidents of the church uh -uh, beginning with the prophet Joseph Smith uh -uh, have supported the King James Version. Yeah, that's why we have the the, the uh, Joseph Smith translation of the Bible. It's actually the inspired version or the revised version, but uh, they don't care. <laughs> By encouraging its continued use in the church. And then plus the book of uh, selections from the Book of Moses, which is King James or the Joseph or Myth translation, uh, Book of Abraham also is redoing the Genesis account, <coughs> and so uh, yeah, Joseph Smith was all about correcting the King James version. So he bends and lies to us here. In light of the above, it is the English translate language Bible used by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The LDS edition of the Bible, 1979, contains King James Version supplemented and clarified by footnotes, study aids, and cross-references to the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants, and the Pearl of Great Price. These four books are the standard works of the Church. We encourage, in other words, they're saying canon. We encourage all members to have their own copies of the complete standard works and to use them prayerfully in regular personal and family study. Study, but stay away from the original languages. Don't come up with the correct translation. And in church meetings and assignments. 
The Jewish Publication Society is the one and only English translation of the Old Testament, the Tanakh as they call it, that is correct. The Masoretes created it in 800 to 1000 AD CE and so the Jewish Publication Society is the one and only true translation and we won't even use that. We won't even acknowledge. However, <clears throat> Uh, first, let's do this. I, I was going through organizing my picture files, came across types of Bible translations. And it's a spectrum graph chart for the different Bible, Christian Bibles that have been translated. And uh, it starts over on uh, the liberal media side word for word it's actually in reverse it's conservative here when it's word for word paraphrasing is more liberal and so uh, you have word for word and so you have the interlinear which I recommend for the Greek <clears throat> I, I've not seen a successful one for the, the Hebrew Old Testament but uh, the interlinear, yeah, new no, inter. Let's see, where is it? Interlinear, interlinear. Uh, 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 international. Today's new international Living translation. They don't list it here. Why not? Why aren't you guys listing it here? <laughs> it's the interlinear. Let me find it on the internet here. Interlinear. New Testament. Ah, gotta check Amazon, I guess. They're not showing pictures. covers look different. There it is. The New Greek English Interlinear New Testament. Personal size. This is the one I recommend. Um, make a uh, save image for you so that you can see what it looks like on the cover. Put it in the proper file and hopefully I'll remember to put it in the video. Uh, this version edition was October 5th, 1993, hardcover. Uh, it has a parallel column for the new revised standard version. I wouldn't bother with that. Uh, it's not a very good translation, but the interlinear part is good. There are some errors due to the bias of Catholic changes to the Greek words. So pay attention to that. If uh, <clears throat> you're going over that. Alright, so then there's also uh, thought for thought and paraphrasing. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it says I'm your master and you must obey me. <laughs> Hilarious. Now here's the King Folly Discourse. This is what Benson did not even dare bring up. It was Joseph Smith, uh, 6th of April, 1844. Ah, and he went to the hospital. I was worried about that. He's supposed to be getting married in November, and he just has a month left. I hope he makes it. So, uh, he says he'll refer to the Bible, because otherwise people will 
tried treason and put him to death. Oh, they did anyway. <laughs> and so here's what he says. I shall comment on the very first Hebrew word in the Bible. I will make a comment on the very first sentence of the history of creation in the Bible. Bereshit. I want to analyze the word. Baith. In. By. Through. And everything else. Rosh. The head. Sheet. Which is incorrect. Because Rosh incorporates the sh. And so it's just eat. Grammatical termination. When the inspired man wrote it, he did not put the baith there. An old Jew, without any authority, added the word. He thought it too bad to begin to talk about the head. It read first, the head one of the gods brought forth the gods. See what he did there? This is the true meaning of the words. Bara signifies to bring forth. If you do not believe it, you do not believe the learned man of God. Oh, I didn't even look to read it. I was looking you straight in the eyes. <laughs> learned men can teach you no more than what I have told you. Thus, the head God brought forth the gods in the Grand Council. And so, how did he do it? Everybody says he's wrong. <laughs> But what he's done is declare that the Jewish Masoretic text, written from 800 to 1000 CE, which the only true translation, correct translation, is from the Jewish Publication Society, is wrong. That those Masoretes made some errors and thus needs to be retranslated. And. In, in case you didn't know, what they did was they added in vowels and vowel points, plus they turned the script from Paleo-Hebrew into Aramaic. And the reason why they changed that was because of the Samaritans who were still using Paleo-Hebrew at this time for their... Ross the Gagnon, the five please weeks. come to the front desk. Ross Gagnon, <coughs> come to the front desk. And, uh, and so the Jews, continuing their eternal hatred of Samaritans, uh, even though Christians now hate them and want to replace them and have been replacing them, have uh, uh, changed it to Aramaic script. For that purpose and so if you go to Psalms 119 in anything but a computer program you will see in the printed text the uh, Aramaic script for each of the Hebrew characters so it's technically not Hebrew script it's Aramaic script but people who want to confuse the issue purposely give the wrong name for it and uh, and so Joseph Smith is saying that the, that translation by the Masoretes is wrong. And so when I took Biblical Hebrew and I was trying to figure out how Joseph Smith made his translation, that's what I was told by my professor, is that the, Jew, the Masoretes had fixed it into one and only one translation. And the Jewish Publication Society has it correct, even though it is wrong because they say when God began and that's the wrong verb the verb is incomplete it needs a prefix determinative to identify the tense and because of the screw up in translation they had to drop it and because I figured it out uh, the grammatical termination, the T, that Joseph Smith refers to, is actually the prefix determinative uh, tense indicator. It's a future tense. And so it's will create, will bring forth. Either one, it doesn't matter. It's the concept of starting and beginning. And thus creation is a starting and beginning. 
<coughs> and uh, and so then you're left with Barosh. And Joseph is right. The B needs to get the hell out of there. It was the Greek version, the Septuagint, that made that error in their translation. At least the one that we have currently. We are told that there was a Greek version from 300 BCE when the Greeks took over. Uh, there was a, a group of uh, uh, 72, 72 Jews who separately and independently worked on a Greek translation of the Bible and when they all got together and compared notes oh it was all exactly the same as the others and so they called it the 70 <laughs> the Septuagint rather than 72 <coughs> and so I uh, it now is in our King James Version as in the beginning God created and that's past tense and that's incorrect and, uh, and that's what the faith was put in for is in the beginning God created and uh, there's the problem that Joseph Smith brings out later in his King Fod sermon about Elohim needing to be translated as plural all the way through the Bible and it's the Jewish Masoretes who because of trying to fix a translation screwed it up and made it a plural majesty so that it can be singular in meaning and thus uh, for number and sex can be plural but correspond with a uh, a singular uh, verb yeah Elohim being a noun <clears throat> and so thus how they justified it they created new language grammar in order to make their translation work And so, yes, Joseph Smith is right. An old Jew was working on it. And uh, it would have been just one individual, even though there were groups that were involved. And uh, if you were to learn biblical Hebrew, uh, you would go through your biblical Hebrew text and you would see the different groups as they put different endings, grammatical terminations and uh, the different use of vowels and even spelling of words this is where the problem comes in of them turning uh, Ra for example uh, which is contained in the name Ruth it has the female T ending from Egyptian rather than Hebrew which would be Ah so it would be Ra Ah would be her name if it were Hebrew but they're using the Egyptian ending of T. That was the particular uh, Jewish group that kept the Egyptian endings uh, for female singular. Otherwise, it would be a, a Hebrew female plural. And, uh, <coughs> and that was a different group of Jews that were using that. So the there's some complications in trying to retranslate the Hebrew text without using the Jewish Publication Society's correct and one only translation. <coughs> and then Ra, as a word itself, is also by one of the groups uh, assumed to be missing an S so that it's supposed to be translated as evil and so in uh, the tree of life versus the tree of knowledge of good and evil yeah it's the tree of knowledge of good and raw but because of the one group it becomes evil instead of raw so the mysteries of God is removed from the Bible 
<laughs> because they don't want Egyptian deities in their Bible because they don't understand they're Egyptian, not Babylonian. <coughs> so they have no problems putting in Babylonian deities. <laughs> But uh, they don't want anything to do with Egyptian. They've, they've banned their heritage. And so uh, then we get to what Joseph Smith, or well, the Book of Mormon actually, uh, what the Book of Mormon covers for how the Book of Mormon was written. And yes, learning of the Jews, as I constantly repeat for you in many of my videos, it's a Jewish text, or a manner of Jewish text. But also, it says the language of the Egyptians. This has to do with the name of the Jewish Christ, who's supposed to be the Joseph Smith's Christ. And it's not the Christian Christ, because it's Jesus for Christians. It's Emmanuel. Emmanuel is a transliteration from the Egyptian documents, merged with El, which is a Canaanite title for deity, God. And so take off the El, and you have Iman. <coughs> and Iman is the name of the Christ for the Jews. Isaiah gave the name and uh, told about it in prophecy. And the prophecy is supposed to correspond with the prophecy in Deuteronomy chapter 18 verses 15 through 18. A man like Moses is Emmanuel, the God Amen. And it's from the Egyptians as I've gone over with you. Uh, it's a transliteration, which is taking a foreign word and directly keeping it as the foreign phonetics into another language. So instead of um, Jesus, Jesus is the Greek. If we were to transliterate Jesus from the Hebrew word, it would be the book of, or it would be Joshua. And so the angel appears to Joseph, quotes from Isaiah, saying that you're required to name him Emmanuel. And so Joseph then calls him Joshua instead of Emmanuel or Jesus. That would be transliteration to call it Joshua. And so it'd be Joshua the Christ that Christians would be going around and talking about if they were to transliterate the name. But instead they use the Greek phonetics. And so the us at the end of Jesus is the masculine singular ending. And so it's uh, Yeshua. Because the J comes from the corruption into the European languages uh, as uh, Spaniards then turned it into an H. So Jesus instead of Jesus. Uh, the Germans uh, are more inclined to change it to the J. <coughs> Jesus. And then they also created what was called Yiddish for the Jews. But uh, uh, let's see. Book of Mormon, yeah. Language of the Egyptians. So what is it in Egyptian? It's Amun. And you have it in our Book of Abraham facsimiles. Uh, Joseph Smith. Uh, the papyra, the hypocephalus, uh, the thing that was placed behind the head of the mummy, the dead person, uh, the circular uh, picture, was uh, uh, missing some pieces on it. And so to fill it in and make it complete, 
What was done was the Joseph Smith papyra had some pictures and Joseph never got to those to translate them and explain them. And I, I put it in number three, it looks like. Yeah, it's made to represent God sitting upon his throne, clothed with power and authority, with a crown of eternal light upon his head, representing the grant also representing also no Egyptologist, no Mormon apologist has caught what Joseph Smith just did there. I did it because I deciphered Paleo Hebrew, thus I uh, deciphered the ca Egyptian characters that were not put in sign lists and uh, then going back over and reading from Joseph and then oh yeah he knew it because I had deciphered the Egyptian characters not put in the sign lists because there are levels of translation and that's what Joseph Smith is telling us is that there are levels of translation for these pictures and uh, but uh, facsimile number three or figure number three in facsimile number two uh, is Amun. That's who it is. And you can see that he's a seer because it's got the two eyes of Horus, one in front of him, one behind him. Uh, and uh, uh, everybody complains, oh, you can't do that. You can't do that. Sure, you can. It changes the translation of Apocephalus, but he can do it. There's nothing wrong with that. So don't listen to these professionals with PhDs. They don't know what they're talking about. Because <laughs> I just stepped in, went, oh, yeah, these need to be translated too. That needs to be translated. Amun sitting on his throne in the heavens needs to be translated. And Joseph knew about it. He didn't quite do a full translation of it, but he tells us in the explanation of what a fuller translation would be. And I'm the one who did give a fuller translation. Nobody else, because nobody else knows this manner of translating Egyptian. But that's all Emmanuel that Isaiah is talking about. The sun at noonday, or the most high, as translated in the uh, New Testament Gospels. So Luke, for example, his name is the Son of the Most High. Son of Amun Ra. Son of Amun. Oh, hey, Joseph uses that in our Doctrine and Covenants, doesn't he? Yes, he does. Yes, he does. Except that it was spelled A-W-M-A-N, not A-H. But you guys don't know that because you're not looking at the Joseph Smith papers to learn that it's the Danites who spelled it A H M A N. So, Danites, what? You're not watching my videos. And so, what Joseph Smith is explaining in the King Follett sermon is not only does the biblical Hebrew text need to be translated correctly but with the Book of Mormon we also understand that the biblical text came from the Egyptian documents and guess who made that discovery <laughs> yep it was the natural process <clears throat> making decipherments thus makes discoveries so yah the hebrew god i found was pictorially the same spelling as zeus again us masculine singular ending get rid of that exact same god they just tell different stories about their god whether it's the israelites that are talking about them or the greeks who are talking about them but it's the exact same name it's just nobody but me figured that out that is mine so give me the credit and I still don't have a Wikipedia page to this day <laughs> but paleo Hebrew is my number one seller on Amazon <laughs> and so 
No. I, I haven't really pursued much of this. I've been focused on the latter days and the signs of the latter days and warning you guys about the latter days and condemning you for missing the exodus in 2020. <laughs> As YouTube attacks me for warning you. Because they think uh, they falsely accuse me of denying a certain creeping death that occurred as prophesied in section uh, 45 verse 31 and 32 Joseph Smith knew it too <clears throat> but uh, uh, this is how the Bible was it's and so when Benson tells you there is no original source documents to render a correct translation from he's lying we have the Egyptian documents. I've done the publication, it's on academia.edu to show you how it was done. I do a reverse engineering from the Bible to the Egyptian documents because uh, Benson's not a true prophet. He's not a translator. And they don't even claim translator if you hadn't noticed, as I keep reminding you. They don't have translator. Joseph Smith put translator. They're supposed to be translator if they're going to be the true successors. They're not the true successors. They started their own religion, but claim Joseph Smith uh, and have turned him Christian with Jesus instead of the Jewish Christ that Joseph Smith was telling us about with Nephi coming to him on September 22nd. 1823 the bicentennial year being next year <clears throat> prophecies of the Old Testament from Acts which is Deuteronomy 18 15 through 18 and that's his name Emmanuel and uh, you're supposed to be making your checklist about all the prophecies of them and when you come across different candidates here in Utah he's prophesied to be in Utah now you're supposed to be going over the checklist and checking it twice finding out if they're naughty or nice if they're him or not I, I you guys aren't doing it are you so I gave you others and videos to help you out but uh, if you're not gonna do it you're not gonna do it and so, yeah, one of them is that he knows Paleo-Hebrew and Egyptian and corrects the translation of the Bible. So, you're looking for him. Are you looking? No, you're not? You don't care? You, you want to be put into bondage and slavery and destroyed, right? <clears throat> you, that's what you prefer? Because you want to claim that Jesus is going to save you? <laughs> Created by Constantine? which is the cause of Elohim being the plural majesty, by the way. Because what Constantine did in creating Jesus created his nature and character with the word Hamusian. And uh, it has no meaning. It means not real. That's the only meaning it has. But Christians still keep trying to come up with a, a definition for it. They're all wrong. Uh, because you're introducing a physical entity to explain something that's not real. So the most common one that I've heard from Christians is the egg. It's got the outer shell, it has the yolk, and it has the white stuff. And that's supposed to help illustrate the Trinity, that they're three separate, but they're one. No, it's a physical entity that you're using to describe what's not real. You can't do that. That's a false argument to make. It's a fallacious argument. And thus it needs to be dismissed and not used. You gotta figure out something else. And the only thing to figure out is that it's not real. It doesn't exist. Ta-da! <clears throat> Christians have no claim on their God. Now if they want to adhere to the First Amendment, they can believe in the writings about a character named Jesus in the Gospels. That's perfectly fine, but they have to acknowledge that Constantine created Jesus as a non-existent God. Fabian Heath, 
They cannot deny history. They cannot change history with Constantine's lies that changed history, turning the Gospels into literal history. But if a person wants to follow the teachings of the Beatitudes, great, more power to you. You're protected by the First Amendment, but you are not allowed to lie, you are not allowed to replace the Jews, you're not allowed to be bad and criminal. And nobody seems to understand this. And so, Mormons can be Mormon if they want, but they have to acknowledge that Joseph Smith is not their founder. They have to acknowledge that Brigham Young is their founder, who was shut down by the United States for being criminal. So are you sure you want him as your founder? But you can't claim Joseph anymore. You can use the Book of Mormon, but you have to say it's not literal history because the Book of Mormon itself says it's prophecy of the latter days. And so it's coded with stories that are types and shadows of the latter days. It's prophecies for messianic literature. So the characters that are messianic types are about the Ammon, who is the Jewish version of Joseph Smith's Christ. <clears throat> Not Jesus. Jesus is a type and shadow of the Jewish Christ of Joseph Smith. Ammon. <clears throat> And so he doesn't have magical powers, doesn't come from outer space, didn't visit the Americas, although he will be in America, he's in Utah right now. Are you doing your checklist? No, you're not, because you're just learning this for the first time. And so, yeah, and I can go on and on and on and on and on and on and on. But just to show you that the Bible's not translated correctly, and this church has no interest in getting it translated correctly. 